Amen. Thank the Lord for what he is doing. We're going into Bible study tonight, and uh, we're picking up with our Skilled Leaders series. We're on Lesson 3. There's been two or three weeks in the middle there uh, where we uh, had other things going on, but uh, we're picking up with Lesson 3. And, uh, of course, just a little reminder, the four letters that Paul wrote that were dealing with and talking about Philemon, Titus, First and Second Timothy. Uh, Paul was, while he was in prison, was probably writing uh, these letters close to the end of his ministry. Uh, they are unique uh, among all the writings because they are personal uh, letters or personally addressed to uh, individuals in churches and leadership. And, um, and as a whole, Paul is is writing these as, as like uh, letters to these individuals that are able to be read by us today and have relevance in a lot of areas in our lives. So uh, two of uh, Paul's young protégés were Timothy and, and Titus, and each of them uh, was a pastor, and they came from very different backgrounds. They, uh, they minister really in vastly different circumstances. Timothy lived in Ephesus, which was a major city. And um, Titus lived on the island of Crete, and, um, which was uh, quite uh, separated from a large city. But in both of their uh, lives, principles of, of skilled leadership and skilled uh, uh, ministry principles that we're talking about was relevant to both um, Timothy and Titus. And so what we have is we had Paul had... Uh, he left uh, Titus on the island of Crete, and, uh, and the phrase that he uses is to set in order. So, uh, Titus, I'm leaving you, you here with this church, and I want you to set in order. That was the phrase that's used. Uh, set in order the local assemblies and have ordained elders in, in every city. Uh, this had been Paul's policy throughout his travels, and and so it, nothing is different uh, in the island of Crete with Titus. Uh, he wants him to accomplish the, the same task. Uh, and you see that uh, from the very first of the book, in the first chapter, he gives a list of, of uh, character qualifications that Titus should be looking for in people that are leading or should be um, the, the examples within a church. You can see that in chapter 1. And then he urges uh, Titus to be strong. Uh, be aware of false teaching and making sure that um, that there's nothing that's uh, uh, infecting, uh, influencing the people in a negative way. And so uh, you see this throughout the first chapter of Titus, which we we have already studied. And uh, uh, tonight you could you could think of it this way: leadership is about uh, being competent, but uh, Christian leadership is also, firstly, about character. It starts with our character. You want people to be competent. You want people to be uh, wise. You want people to be intelligent and decision-making and all of those things. But it starts with us and our character. Our walk with God is about you and God. If you're going to be a positive influence in life, it's going to start with you. No doubt about it. You can't, you can't live one way at the church, live another way at home, and affect and, and, and expect to affect people the way God wants you to. It, it comes back to our character in private and in public. And so that's where we're picking up on tonight with chapter 2 of Titus. He starts out in verse 1, says, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Uh, Paul begins the, the talk here about Christian behavior because belief, folks, that doesn't affect our behavior is worthless. If my walk with God doesn't change my behavior, something's wrong with my walk with God. Because in my flesh is no good thing. And so my life is not going to be able to remain the same if my walk with God uh, is the way it's supposed to be. So he instructs Titus to teach lifestyle practices to the saints, and he uses this, this phrase that are becoming 
becoming to sound doctrine. If our doctrine is healthy, uh, our lives will be holy. If my walk with God is right, it will affect all areas of my life. If my walk with God is the way it's supposed to be, I'll talk different. I'll act different. I'll respond different in business. All of those things are affected if my character is following the things of God. And so Paul, Paul has a, a mentoring relationship with Titus, and he wants to ensure that this kind of discipling relationship is uh, replicated throughout the church. He doesn't want it just to be, Titus, I want you to be a certain way. No, good disciples make good disciples. If you want people to be good followers of the Lord, guess what? Be a good follower of the Lord. Good disciples make good disciples. He gives different instructions for different categories of people. Older men, older women, younger women, younger men, and he uses the word slaves, which uh, can be translated uh, to employees. Because we face different um, challenges at different stages of our life. What happens to a person in their 20s um, could be quite different than someone in their 60s. What happens to uh, a man in the, uh, his 60s can be very different from a young lady in her 30s. What happens to men and women um, can also be different even uh, in some cases in how we are as employees because maybe not everyone is in uh, a working environment of life. And so he's going to give very uh, explicit instructions here for each of these categories. Now we'll read Titus chapter 2, verse 2. It says that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false, false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. Just going to spend a little bit of time here on each of these because it's important to know what each one, uh, because we're all at different stages of our lives, some younger people, some uh, more uh, older people. That doesn't mean you're old. Just got a few more years. But here's what it says about aged men. To be sober. That means to be discreet. Uh, not extreme. Excessive. Extravagant. What Paul's saying as you get older, calm down. <laughs> calm down. He uses the word grave. That means to be dignified or honorable or worthy of respect. As we become older, then it shouldn't be that we demand respect. We earn respect. Respect is not something you can demand. It's something you earn. He uses the word temperate. That means to be self-controlled, moderate in opinion, careful. As we become older men, it should be that we have more control than we had when we were 25. Should be. Sound in faith, he says. That means healthy, whole, uncorrupted in our conviction. There comes a point in our life where we should have it all settled in what we believe. Men, we shouldn't be trying to figure things out when you get to be old. If you've been in the church, you've got to get it figured out. You've got to get it figured out. Uh, he says, in charity. That means affectionate, benevolent, kind, tender. Just because we get old doesn't mean that we shouldn't be kind. 
And then he says impatience. That's a constancy. Being cheerful, hopeful, enduring. Um, nothing worse than a cranky old man. Is there anything worse than a cranky old man? Don't one say cranky old woman. Don't say that. Nothing worse than a cranky old man. That's what he gives us for aged men. Listen, there should be a place in our life where we're constant and cheerful. Then he goes on to aged women. He says, in behavior as becometh holiness. That's a lifestyle that is becoming suitable or pleasing or appropriate or attracted to holiness attracted to holiness i want to live the way god wants me to live an attraction to holiness as a, as the the woman becomes aged you know what the world's you know what the world's trying to promote that you got to change yourself to look younger you don't have to change yourself to look long, younger. Become attracted to how God has created you and embrace, embrace the age of a woman. Why is a 60-year-old woman trying to be 30? No, I'm serious. You're not. <laughs> who, who are we trying to fool? Allow how God has created wisdom to come to you, wonderful women, and let yourself be attracted to the holiness that God has created for you. Now, he uses, he says, not false accusers. That's leaving out slandering and, and gossip. Don't get caught up, ladies, in gossip. There comes a time when you outgrow. Both men and women should outgrow that. Not given too much wine, he says, uh, to be embonished to wine. It's using the, the, the words that we would use for banqueting uh, today in our English language. Teachers of good things. Examples of actions and attitudes. Teachers of good things. He's, he's saying, listen, there's something that can be learned from the aged women about actions and attitudes. Um, then he says young women, young women to be sober. That means to be discreet, not extreme, extravagant, or excessive. Love their husbands, to be affectionate and fond. Um, I can spend a whole lesson right here. He's not saying to love someone else's husband. Love your own husband. Don't look on the other side of the fence thinking that it's brighter, greener on the other side. Now, this is for both sides. I understand. I get up here and people say, well, you're a man. I'm the pastor. <laughs> okay? The idea is what Paul is saying in Scripture. Love your husband. That's who you're to love. Let there be let there be uh, an affectionate fondness for the man that you have married. It says, love your children. That's a maternal instinct. There's a fondness that you have, uh, uh, young women, that no one else in the world has for children. No one will love your kids like you. No one. I mean... The husband and the father can love the child, but no one carried the child for nine months like you did. No one. No one understands like you do. It says to be discreet. That's discipline, self-controlled. Chaste. That's innocent and modest and pure and clean from defilement. He says to be keepers at home where you guard and, and, and you become domestically inclined that that house, folks, there, I don't know how far I'll get in this lesson. There's something about when mama's in charge at home. Now, listen, I understand there's an authority that the man has and dad has. But there's a guard that comes up from mom. 
Have you ever had it happen in your life where your mother can seem to pick things out <laughs> that's happening in your life that you thought you had hid? She can smell it. She can smell something wrong. She can smell that something. She can sense that something's not quite right. And a persistency of a mother will get to the bottom of it. Listen, this, what Paul's saying, younger women, you have, you have an unbelievable connection to that house. That is your haven. Mm. There's too many places where moms are going home to that's not their haven. It's become chaotic, and life is chaotic, and there's too much turmoil. Listen, when you leave the world, life in the world, on a daily basis, and you go home, it shouldn't be hell at home. Okay, I, I'm just going to tell it. Everything that's happening in the world right now is the enemy attacking the home. It's constant, constant, constant. And Paul's saying, listen, when he says you're a keeper at home, it's, I'm not talking about you can't go out and do something. That's not, listen. On the other side, it doesn't mean that people who are at home don't do anything. <laughs> Let me tell you, that's the opposite of that. The difference is people who are at home are doing all kinds of work and not getting paid for it. <laughs> Be careful when Paul is speaking. and he's, Now, I'm talking about being skilled leaders. There's a, an authority that you have as young women to be domestically inclined that nothing that's harmful is coming to your house and nothing good is leaving your house. That God wants to stay. He says the word good, that's honorable, honest, fair, worthy, kind, obedient, that he says to your own husbands, that's submitted in, in subjection under, that does not mean a doormat. That's not what Paul's saying. That means there's an authority that is responsible over you in this world. That doesn't mean that your life is not important, your opinion's not important. None of those things. That means when the rubber meets the road, there should be a guy that stands to the forefront and says, I'm going to stand between you and that. Okay. <sighs> Everyone okay? Good. And he says this is the reason that the Word of God... Be not blasphemed. See, our culture may disagree with biblical doctrine, but they should be impressed with biblical lifestyle. Did you hear what I said? They may have an issue at times with what you believe, but they should see it in your lifestyle. It shouldn't be that it's just words. It should come out in action. And there should be something that happens. I'll give you another. A Christian family should be the envy of every family in this world. There should be a model family that's put out there. If you love God and got God in your life and God's in the center of your home, it should be that every family wants to be just like yours. Doesn't mean that everything's perfect. You got imperfect people. But it should be that, man, their life of serving God has created this atmosphere of family. And it should be the model of what the Bible teaches. See, the world may not like it when you talk about self-control and submission. But they should find it attractive when we live it. They may be repelled by Christian teachings on morality and marriage and Folks, if you talk about that too much today, they, 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 you'll be labeled. But they should be attracted to Christian lives and marriage when they see your home together and your family as one. 
An apostolic life should be an example of what people want to be. That's what our, our lives should represent. This first institution that God put in place was family. And if we're going to be skilled leaders, we got to start right at home. Right at home. And so Paul's given all the descriptions. And he's going through, he's going through each. Listen, mothers of young children, don't let culture define you by what you do or don't do in life. Don't. Your greatest contribution to the kingdom of God may not be something you do, but rather who you train. If you're past the age and your children are growing and you want to do something in life, I'm, I'm not preaching against that. What I am saying is don't let there be a greater influence on your kids than you. That's what I'm saying. No one should be influencing your family more than you do. So, here's what he says. And he's going to add young men here. And he doesn't say a lot about young men. Sober-minded. Basically means to be disciplined and self-controlled. Paul thinks that if we can get young men under control and to be disciplined, they'll probably turn out okay. Young men only receive that sort of exhortation. Now notice that, that Titus is told to teach the aged men and the aged women and the young men, but not the young women. Titus is not given the instruction to teach the young women. They are to be taught by the aged women. So Titus would avoid temptation or any hint of immorality. Folks, that's almost 2,000 years ago. <laughs> if that was relevant almost 2,000 years ago, I can tell you that's been magnified <laughs> however many times since that. So here's, here, here's, here's my point. I won't, well, I would never do this. Ask all the ladies of a certain age to stand. That would be, that would be like a death trap. I was, I was selling insurance one time, and uh, the woman wanted me to do a quote for her, but she was absolutely adamant that she was not telling me her age. And... Pricing is based upon age. And no, she said, I'm not telling you that. And I was, I mean, I was, I, I was, it was impossible. So I thought, how am I going to get around that? So I decided that I would put it for 10 years older than I thought she was. I'll tell you what, she wasn't long telling me that she was not such and such an age. <laughs> Here I am to tell you tonight, uh, older ladies, you have an incredible responsibility in this church. If you ever feel significant, it is right now in 2023 in what Paul is saying. If you ever get to a place where you feel insignificant, it's a lie from the enemy. A lie from the enemy. Because you have the responsibility according to what Paul is saying, to be the example and to teach the young ladies and young women of what God desires for them to be. That is a huge responsibility. You have such a significant place in the kingdom. Remember that Titus's job is to ordain elders in the church. And elders means maturity. It's not totally based upon age. It's based upon character and consistency. It means a mature person. Just because someone's old in age does not mean they are mature spiritually. 
And just because someone may be younger in accordance to age does not mean that they are not mature. Now, obviously, maturity and age and being a little older comes together in most cases, in some cases. But if you're young, find someone to disciple you. If you're old, find someone to disciple. And if you're in between, then do both. Leaders, skilled leaders, skilled people in the church are to be a pattern for others in all things. In all things. Verse 7. He says, in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Titus is a leader and a pastor. But notice here, Paul writes more about Titus being an example than he does about him being an exhorter. Titus, you will preach a way more by what you do than just what you say. It isn't any different today, church. Actions, as you have heard said, speaks louder than words because a leader is best by what he or she does, not just by what she or he says. Uh, now, that doesn't mean words are not important. He says to use sound speech. That means healthy words so that the enemy wouldn't have anything to use against you. Don't let there even be an occasion for the enemy to use words that you have spoken, lifestyle that you have lived against you in any way. Verse 9, exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all goods fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. He's talking about, uh, in the instance he uses the word slaves, which we understand in today's context as employees. And he says, listen, we're, we're to be obedient. Do what we're asked. Do what we're asked. That doesn't mean outside of the bounds of the word of God, but there's nothing wrong with doing what, you ask, what you're asked. Please them well. That means to do more than just what you're asked. If anyone should see an example, it should be from a child of God to an employer. Do more than what's asked. Not answering again. That's not talking back and not arguing. Not purloining, that means don't steal. And that's not just taking physical things, that could be also time. That can also be the value of what you're doing with your time when you're supposed to be working. These are things that should be a good example. It should be that the employer wants to hire a Christian. Do you hear what I'm saying? It shouldn't be that they hear that you're a Christian and they back away from hiring you. No, it should be, you know what? This is going to be a good worker. This is going to be an honest worker. This is going to be a person that's going to do what's asked enough and above and beyond. Above and beyond. Uh, and then he says fidelity. That means consistency. That your outward actions match your inward conviction. Don't let, it, don't let it be that you say you believe a certain thing, but you show up at the Christmas party and it's not that at all. Is everyone just tired tonight or what? Let it be shown in how you treat the employer, how you treat the business, how you treat the clients, how you treat the customers, how, let it be that you adorn the doctrine. He says, beautify the Bible. That's what it means, in the eyes of others. When they come to your counter, when they, when you show up at their house to do something, when, let it be that the 
Bible is beautified through your life as a Christian. Let it be that you left a presence of God in that situation no matter what the day was like. And you know, sometimes the more challenging of the day, the greater impression that you can actually leave as a Christian. Because sometimes it just causes people to go right off the deep end. But let your life be an example that you got a hold of Jesus and he's going to help you through the day. He's going to give you wisdom to make wise decisions. He's going to give you words to say when you didn't have the words to say. Let it be that it radiates from you as a child of God. Amen. Verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Grace is the power to live above sin. Grace is what teaches us. Listen, this is where I was, and this is where I am now because of what God has done in my life. Christians are to, he says, deny. That means refuse, reject, contradict ungodliness. Say, you know what? I'm not allowing that into my life. I'm not allowing that into my speech. I'm not allowing that into my thoughts. I'm not allowing that into my lifestyle. Whatever is unlike God. He goes on to say, and worldly lusts that cause it. Things that, I mean, are just being magnified in our society right now. Don't allow yourself to be controlled by that stuff. He gives us what we are, we are to do. He says to live soberly. That's our attitude and actions towards ourselves. Be happy with yourself. Like yourself. Have you been around people that don't like themselves? I'm not talking about other people not liking them. They don't like themselves. Everything's wrong. Everything's terrible. They look terrible. They feel terrible. They act terrible. It's depressing. God created you in his image. He took up residence in your life with his spirit. He sealed you with the Holy Ghost. He's building a place for you that where he is, you may be also. <laughs> I mean, live soberly. Let your attitude and your action about yourself be positive. Not talking about conceit and, you know, I'm not talking about all, I'm just talking about just like yourself. <laughs> God didn't create you with leftover parts. He created you in his image. He created you just the way he wanted you. Yeah. Be happy as the word used here, soberly, attitude and actions toward ourselves. Then he uses the word righteously. That's towards others. It's interesting that they go in disorder. If you don't like yourself, you'll have problems liking others. Righteously, that's how you live right towards others. And godly, that's towards God. Listen, get yourself away from all the bad stuff and say, you know what? This is who I am. I'm God's child. I'm going to be an example to every person I come, come in contact with. I've got a relationship with God. Nothing's perfect. I'm still working on a lot of things, but God brought me a long way. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Christians live in this present world, but they do not live like this present world. And they do not live for this present world. I'm in it, but I don't have to like it, this world, and I'm not living for it. 
I've got my relationship with God, and this is not my home, but I'm going to do everything I can while I'm here to show what God has done through our lives. See, our motivation to live godly lives is the hope, Paul said to Titus, the hope of heaven, that appearing of Jesus Christ, looking for that blessed hope. (laughs) Amen. What a beautiful hope. The desire is to spend eternity with the Lord. See, we live between two appearances of the Almighty. The first appearance was the grace of God. He came, died on a cross, that we could be saved. The second appearance is the glory of God. You can notice in verse 11, it says, behind us. Verse 13, ahead of us. The grace of God got me to where I am. The glory of God is hauling me to where I'm going. Amen. I'm living my life by both appearances of what God's done in my life. Not only, hallelujah, where he brought me from, but where he's taken me. Oh, let that arise in your spirit. This is what, this is what allows you to be the influence God wants you to be. Well, you know what? I just got a terrible, terrible past. You know what? This, this, and this. I was in this, this, and this, and I did this, this, and this. Okay, get over it. Move on to where God's taken you. He brought me out of that, which was darkness, into his marvelous light. (laughs) Hallelujah. I'm looking for the blessed hope. (laughs) I've got my eyes fixed uh, on where he's taken me and not where, just where I came from. This is about your influence on people. I can see I'm not going to get through all of this. Legalism says what we do leads us to who we are. Grace says who we are leads us to what we do. If you get yourself caught up in the past, that's where you'll dwell. Unfortunately, some people can't get past the past. His grace is too powerful, church, for you to live in the past. His grace is so powerful that he brought you out of the past. And he's taken you to where he desires for you to be. He already sees you where he desires for you to be. He already has you there. He already sees you victorious. He already sees you as a positive influence. That's his desire. He's not holding his breath, gritting his teeth, thinking whether you're going to be okay or not. He already sees you. He filled you with his power. You got everything. We got everything we need. Amen. Verse 15. These things speak and exhort and rebuke With all authority, let no man despise thee. Titus, he says, teach with authority. And don't let anyone intimidate you. That doesn't mean you put your fist up to everything that's happening in life. Just be confident of who you are. In God. I have stated this to people in many occasions. If they could just find out who they are in God, it would change everything about their life. Everything that's happening, listen, the circumstances of life, some things are beyond your control. But if you only can find out who you are in him, the circumstances of this life will not define you. The purpose he has for your life will define you. Life won't be what defines you. It'll be who you are in him that defines you. You are a child of the king. Why would we want to belittle that? 
Why would we want to water that down? You're a child of the king. He adopted you into the family. <laughs> Hallelujah. He grafted you into the vine. <laughs> he purchased you with his own blood. You're a child of the king. Don't belittle that. Find out who you are in God. That changes your outlook in life. Okay. I'm not going to get through the rest. Boy. Well, maybe I'll just start. Got seven minutes. Titus chapter 3. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts, pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, and hating one another. Paul's given quite a list there, isn't he? Christians, he says, are exhorted to be good citizens. That's, that was the case during the Roman Empire. And he's actually wanting us to be good citizens today. Our heavenly citizenship doesn't excuse us, folks, from our earthly citizenship. Paul tells us that being critical and those types of mentalities, that should not enter into our thinking. People that look at your life, my life, should see the grace of God and what God has done. Can I tell you, if you're looking for something wrong, you can find it. No problem. You'll find one thing, then you'll find ten things. If you're looking for stuff wrong, there'll be no trouble to find things wrong. Get your focus on things that are right. And allow what God has done in your life to be enacted out to others. That you become a magnet of what God has done in your life. Do you know what? You and I are to be conduits of his grace and mercy as it flows through us to other people becomes a problem when it shuts off and I say it's just for me I was preaching in Ghana and it was where we're going to be starting a new church and it was such a powerful uh, weekend of services and brother Poitras who was missionary there I said you know you have a better understanding of the culture and Maybe you could do the altar call. We're in a wide open field. I don't even know how many hundreds and hundreds of people were there. So I, I preached and it was hot. <laughs> really hot. And uh, Brother Poitras gets up at the end and he said, I am the only one getting a blessing tonight. And I thought, what is he doing? Then I saw someone in the crowd put their hand up. He said, put your hand down. You're not getting a blessing. I'm the only one getting a blessing. And then I saw people stand up. And he said, go back. Don't come up. Stay back. I'm the only one getting a blessing. And then there was just hundreds and hundreds of people that flocked that altar. It was like a reverse psychology of some sort. And I watched as the power of God touched people's lives and, and enacted itself. In the grace of God, the mercy of God was just flowing in such a powerful way. I'd love to have it at Mission Point where people don't know too many people at the altar. <laughs> too many people. Pastor, we're flooding the altar. We're going to be a conduit of his grace and mercy that as we go through this service and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, whatever opportunities we have, the love of God is going to shine through our lives. Listen, don't allow a critical spirit to come into your spirit. Let the love of God be a, uh, shine through you and let your light be a conduit uh, of what God has done. You will have no problem finding things wrong if you want. But how powerful it is when you become a flow for the power of God's presence and the power of God's spirit. 
and the moving of the Holy Ghost through your life. And people see the grace that has happened in you and the change that took place. This is what, I mean, all you have to do is look at Paul's, what he's saying. Foolish, disobedient, and deceived, and, and divers lusts, and, and, and malice, and envy, and hate, hateful, and hating one another. I mean, there were some bad situations. You can find it. But you can find the grace of God if someone's letting it flow. I'm talking about being a positive influence, a skilled leader that when people see your life, this is not just for the ministry. This is not just for the pulpit. This is not just for the pastor. This is for every saint of God, amen, that God allows your, your life to be the example that he wants. Study through that second chapter of of Titus, study through that over the next few days and start yourself into chapter 3 and see what Paul has given as an example of what God wants in your and my life. Would you stand tonight? Oh, I feel his presence. I feel his spirit. I feel the power of the Holy Ghost in my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, just let it radiate from you. Why don't you just let your hands be raised before the Lord tonight? Just you and God right now. Just you and him. Oh, God, would you allow my life to be what you want it to be? Hallelujah, Lord, the things that are not of you in my heart. Would you take those out, God? Oh, God, would you forgive me of the things, God, that are contrary to your will? word and let your love let your mercy let your grace flow through my life God that I would be the example that you want me to be a skilled leader of influence God in people's lives that when they come in contact with each and every one of us they see you they see you Jesus the changer of all hearts the changer of lives the transformer God of people's lives, let them see you. Oh, God. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, I thank the Lord for what I feel in his presence. We just barely got started into chapter 3. We'll, we'll finish that next week. Amen. Thank you for being in Bible study tonight. We're just trying to be what God wants us to be. Amen. And if we become what God wants us to be, there's no, there's no limit to what God will do. Amen. God bless you tonight. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord. Amen.